there is a house in New Orleans. They call the rising sun. Been the ruin of many a poor boy in God. I know I'm one. In 1964, around the time of the British invasion, of course, the Beatles were making huge inroads into the pop category and screaming up the charts. Well, along came Eric Burden and the Animals with their own R&B type of sound. You remember songs like Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood and, of course, House of the Rising Sun. Then he carried that through the psychedelic era with uh, Sky Pilot and San Francisco Nights. Eric Burden, so many hits, so many years. You must have a few highlights you'd like to talk about. Well, I can always remember, uh, you know, when the House of the Rising Sun went to number one and we were doing a small gig in England and um, I went on, we went on stage to do the show as normal and all of a sudden there was like this rush and the audience was like this glow, you know, from the crowd because they knew, they knew before we did that the record had gone to number one in the United States and uh, you know, that was re memorable. But I mean, for me, uh, some of the most memorable moments in, in music are not the big things, they're the small things. Like, a few months ago I was jamming in a club in New Orleans and uh, it was, there was a heavy rainstorm going on outside and so most of the people had left. And uh, there was about 12 people in the place and three of them were cops because it was an all-night uh, police watering hole. And myself and two guitar players, and um, I just walked off the stage realizing that I'd probably done the best performance in my life. But it was like, you know, a dozen people had to witness it. So it's immaterial whether the, whether the crowds are big or small. It's, it's, it's the, the, when you feel the moment, you know the moment. That's what's beautiful about it. And uh, you never know when, when that's going to be. Eric, you had so many hits throughout so many years and so many fans and then all of a sudden it kind of stopped. I mean, what was it like to experience that sort of void? I don't care about the voids, you know, I don't care. I mean, uh, I, di I, I did what I, what I did and I have very little regret for the things that I've done. I've, and, a, and, I, and I hear still people, I can still hear people's voices ringing in my ears. You're your own worst enemy, you know, you're never gonna make it, you know, you know. What's so big in making it? You know why? Why so much stress on on money? You know you can only want, own one horse. You can only own, drive one car at a time. You know it, it may be nice to have an apartment in New York, so it saves your hotel bills, and it may, you know. And sometimes I, I think when I need to buy something for my daughter, and I would like to have the money to lay out, you know, money for for her edu education. Or, uh, something important like that, then money's important. But beyond that, I don't think it's that really that important. You know? I mean, the animals were taken for a fortune. You know, I mean, six million dollars down the drain in a Bahamian bank account. And, uh, you know, it was all set up through very um, old world rigid English banking systems. But, but there was a change of government in the Bahamas and, you know, we went to look for the money and it was gone. But, uh, you know, I'm alive and there's a lot of people that are, that are dead. When I was young it was more important Pain, more painful and laughter so much louder yeah. when I was young, When I was young My faith was so much stronger than I believed in fellow men I was really so much older than When I was young 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 Our British special continues with Cliff Richard, coming up next.
Turning points in your career, Cliff, uh, can you take us back to some of your earliest uh, fondest memories? Well, turning points, I mean, funny enough, I guess my career has been an unusual one. First of all, I guess because it's, uh, it's lasted as long as it had. None of us expected, at least of all me, that I would still be talking about a career after 32 years. Um, but I think one of, the, one of the reasons why I've stayed, uh, certain, certainly in Britain, is because there haven't been any real turning points. What I did was, and again, with hindsight, it's, it's easier to look back and see what I did. Um, from the moment I recorded Move It, uh, when you look back, it becomes inevitable that I would have done what I did. But what I did was I kept following my nose in one direction. I kept within the confines of pop rock music. I kept within the confines of the things that I found easy to sing. I found it not too difficult to sing ballads like Miss Unites and couple them with songs like Devil Woman, which, desired, which demanded a different technique of singing and, and presented a different image. But it was still within the confines of what I would call uh, the rock and roll musical culture that there is. And, and so I didn't make any great massive turns. In other words, sometimes when you do a massive turn, people still get, the you know, people that follow you want you to keep this line and you've gone this way, and that's where a lot of people lose out. So I just tried to make a progression happen that was much more natural. You know, it's like, um, it's like when you, you know, my family still look the same to me. My sisters look exactly as I've always remembered them. And yet when we dig out old photographs, you realize there were some fantastic physical changes that took place in all our lives. Um, but if you, if, you, if you change gradually, which is what aging is, then people don't notice it. And so in the same way in Britain, for instance, my career seems to have gone on forever because I've chased, I've chased that same line and, and haven't made any major great turns. That and the fact that you haven't aged one bloody year, Cliff, for crying out loud. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, that's very kind of you. Thank you. No, I mean, I know that's not true entirely. Um, uh, actually, funny enough, in Florida, when I was in Florida, it was this, this made my decade. Uh, we went to uh, Universal Studios, uh, took a day off from Walt Disney. I was staying in the Walt Disney World uh, area, which was a fantastic holiday, by the way. I recommend it to anybody. But we took a day off and went and spent some time in Universal. And there was a guy there that says, I can guess your weight within three or four pounds. I can guess your age within three years either way. Um, and so my friend said, come on, d d deal with this guy. <laughs> so I stood in front of him. He said, can you take your glasses off? I took my glasses off. And and he asked me a few questions, and he said, okay, he said, I guess 38. Hey! So he nearly died when I told him I'd be 51 this year, but I, that made my decade, I tell you. But the main thing is, I don't look 25, and I don't look 18. I don't particularly want to look like that. Uh, you know, uh, I guess if I can stick around looking about 38, 40, I'd be very, very happy. Come on, baby, baby, let's move it out. All right, how about some 60s metal for you? Deep Purple, The Yardbirds, and Led Zeppelin. But I can go on stage and play my instrument, which is the organ, and I know 90% of the audience are going to be listening to what I'm playing. Not, they're not there to say, oh, that's one of the deep purple. Uh, uh, what a groovy guy, you know, look at the clothes he's wearing. Uh, I must get his autograph because they've been uh, in the top Are you top saying 10. that's what happens in England? It does. Still? But we're incredibly chart conscious. What do you find the difference between the British and the American audiences? Um, well, I, I'd say the British, I mean, I'm not attacking them, but they, obviously what with the English scene being so big within the last three years, two or three years, and yet it, it even being, you know, bigger before that, um, they've become so saturated that um, they don't really show very much appreciation, even though they are liking it, you know. Um, you don't get the big sort of um, riot things and mobbing the stage anymore. I mean, that's just finished completely. Have you any ambitions unfulfilled? Yeah, well, I'm making a film. On your own? Yeah. Well, what is it? With equipment. Oh, it's just a sort of system of events, you know. <laughs> it's not finished yet. It started. What inspired you to go into film? Was it, was it, uh, blur? Um, I suppose in a way subconsciously it could have had a lot to do with it, yeah. But, um, I've always been interested in movie making as an amateur. And I started to buy sort of professional equipment. 
which cost a fortune. We asked him what we did with our money. <laughs> and that's, you know, I'm just going to, as soon as we get some free time, I'm going to really hang into it.